Good morning and welcome to MEC's presentation on the mobile tidal wave. I am Nathan Sorensen, Strategic Information Technology Procurement Officer for the Midwestern Higher Education Compact. We thank you for joining us for today's webinar on MEC's contract with Novell featuring the mobile tidal wave. A few housekeeping items before we get started. This call is being recorded so that we may make it available online. In addition, we will email you the slides after the presentation. To ensure everyone can hear, we have muted the lines. We will also encourage you to ask lots of questions by using the chat feature located on the left-hand portion of your screen. In the event we cannot answer all the questions in the time allotted, we will respond after this event. Finally, at the conclusion of this webinar, you will receive a brief survey. Please be sure to give us your feedback so that we can continue to improve our webinar series. Before turning the controls over to our guest presenter from Novell, I'd like to briefly introduce you to the Midwestern Higher Education Compact and how we arrive at this contract with Novell, as well as some informational resources available to you regarding this contract. To help you understand our contracting authority and why MEC is involved with these technology contracts, it's best to have a better understanding about our organization. We are an interstate compact charged with advancing Midwestern higher education through interstate cooperation and resource sharing. The Midwestern Higher Education Compact is one of four regional higher education compacts in the United States with each having their own niche for addressing issues and advocating for higher education. Often referred to as MEC, our niche was rooted in cost savings programs created by and supported by stakeholders from our 12 Midwestern states. Those states include Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Kansas, Michigan, Minnesota, Missouri, Nebraska, North Dakota, Ohio, South Dakota, and Wisconsin. The compact is governed by a 60-member board, which we call the Commission. It's made up of governors, designees, legislative, and higher education leaders, essentially trying to help students get into and matriculate through college as well. We are a source in policy where we attempt to help decision makers such as governors, legislators, and higher education leaders in our member states to make more informed decisions and provide them with information. MEC has agreements in place to extend our technology cost savings program to the Southern Regional Education Board and to the Western Interstate Commission for Higher Education. Currently, we have no agreement with the New England Board of Higher Education. And as the map shows, there are three states not covered by any of the compacts. They include New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. What a compact is, well, it is really a contract amongst the states. This legislation that was passed in each member state makes us an instrumentality of state government in the 12 member states. Similarly, the other compacts have been statutorily created. What makes the compact unique to the higher education community is its broad contracting authority created in each of its member states. The compact is not a group purchasing organization. The compact is a means for stakeholders in the 12 member states to collaborate on identifying regional issues and committing resources to leverage a solution through the compact statutory authority. We are very selective in the types of contracts that we pursue. We try to identify those areas that we can bring value 
And as a result, it will be something that an individual institution may not be able to replicate on its own. But because we are working together across state lines, regionally, and now nationally, we can bring value that wouldn't have otherwise been there. The Novell MEC Higher Education Collaborative is a sole source agreement between Novell and MEC for the joint purposes of making Novell products, services, and training more accessible and affordable to the MEC member states. The contract was initially negotiated in 2002 and is automatically extended on an annual basis by agreement between both MEC and Novell. Who is eligible to utilize the agreement? All higher education institutions in the MEC 12 state region using Novell's academic licenses. You are eligible for the Novell MEC discount. For K-12 entities, check with your Novell account manager to determine your eligibility to use the Novell MEC discount. To receive the discounts uh, either by joining or renewing is four easy steps. I'll quickly show you these easy steps to join or renew, which can be done by selecting software from the top toolbar of MEC's e-commerce website, mechtech.org. You can click on the drop-down menu at the left or click on the Novell logo to go to the no Novell contract page. Once on the Novell page, you will be able to find contract highlights, contract terms, and specific Novell contract information. On the right-hand side, under Contract Eligibility, you will find clickable links for each of the eligible parties. To join or renew, simply follow steps 1 through 4 in the left-hand toolbar of the Novell MAC Collaborative pages, or simply click the Proceed to the Next Step at the bottom of each page. Here is uh, Step 2. Please note, in Step 2, you will need to complete the Novell MEC Higher Education Collaborative Worksheet and submit it to MEC. Step 3 offers uh, Novell's premium service support. And finally, any contacts you would like us to keep in touch with may be submitted in Step 4. Also, please don't hesitate to contact our staff. At the top is my contact information. We have also included our legal counsel should you have any direct questions for Rob as well. Now, on to today's special presenter, Joel Martin. He is a sales engineer in North America Collaboration Solution Principal at Novell. Joel, can you please uh, Give the audience a brief uh, introduction to yourself and to your presentation, the mobile tidal wave. Sure. All right. Thank you very much, Nathan. Yes, <clears throat> yeah, my name is Joe Martin, sales engineer with Novell. I've been with Novell for a couple of years now and actually very active in our academic community. Uh, in particular, some of you on the uh, the uh, excuse me, the presentation today may be members of our TTP Technology Transfer Partners Program. Um, in fact, uh, if, if you are, you probably recognize my name. 
So I'm based out of Chicago. Uh, I've worked with uh, Illinois and Wisconsin customers in particular in the past. I'm actually uh, starting to work with a little broader geographical region. Um, but anyways, uh, regardless of who I work with in particular, you know, I'm, I'm here as a resource really to help anyone that uh, may have challenges in the environment that Novell may be able to solve. And that's really what I'm here to do today is to go through kind of discuss some of the solutions that we have out there for any environment that's dealing with mobile devices, which is pretty common with just about any uh, academic environment. Uh, and you'll actually get to see these uh, solutions uh, live here towards the end when we do a, a brief demonstration. Uh, as we go along, I do encourage you to go ahead and ask any questions you may have. Please type those in the chat window, and I will uh, you know, be on the lookout for those. In the demo portion, I will lean on Nathan to uh, keep me apprised of any questions that are popping up. So if you, again, feel free to do that. Or also, uh, when this is uh, finished and you get the uh, follow-up email with the survey, there will be some information in there, including my contact details, so you can always reach me afterwards if you've got any questions or anything like that. So with that being said, let's go ahead and dive into this and talk about how you know, we can help that sort of that onslaught, that tidal wave you have of mobile devices coming into your environment. Now, the, just to, to frame this up, you know, let, let's talk about how we view this space and, and how we're really a, a little different from a lot of the other vendors that are out there. You've got a lot of vendors that will come in and say, hey, you know, you, you've got uh, people with iPads coming in or Android phones. You know, we've got a mobile X solution, right? So we've got a, a mobile printing solution, or we've got a mobile file access, mobile device management. It's definitely that, that piece is, is very uh, popular right now. And, you know, and that's fine and dandy to say, you know, you're here to just provide one specific component, one specific you know, challenge that may be out there, find a way to solve that. But what we do is we say, you know what, it, it's not about saying you've got a specific mobile device and I need to do one specific thing on that mobile device. We say, you know what, these are part of your life. They're being used on a daily basis by everyone, by students, uh, teachers, you know, everyone in the environment. And so at the end of the day, all they are is just a smaller form factor device, but everybody just wants to do the same stuff with them, right? If I have a laptop or a desktop, you know, I could check my email, I could get to my files, I can print, I can get to my apps, IT can control the devices, push out apps, things like that. None of that should change just because I'm on a smaller device now, you know, a tablet or a smartphone. And so that's where we really differ is we come in and we, we view this holistically. We offer a broad range of solutions, as you see uh, with me going on the presentation. And again, that's how we view all of this is that this isn't some special area. These are just part of the daily life. Everyone is already do, using these. Uh, they need to be able to do all the same tasks with them that they used to do. And, and the reason this has changed, let's talk about it. You know, I've got a few slides here. We're going to go into some of the, the background as far as how we even got to this point. So if you look how things used to be, um, you know, I remember back in the mid-'90s working with a lot of K-12 through schools in central Illinois, setting up numerous labs. In fact, I remember rolling out a lot of Windows 95 back in the day, uh, hitting uh, some NetWare 3 servers. But anyways, you know, that's how it was, right? The, the learning process always happened at school, uh, as far as IT goes, you had tight controls over what devices are being used, where they're going to be used, things like that. You maybe occasionally would have people trying to get in remotely, but it didn't happen too often. Right? But because of these little smaller devices making it very easy to take you know, a computer essentially with you wherever you go, now the learning process can happen anywhere. You know, you've got distance learning, especially in higher ed institutions. Um, and you've got really, in, in theory, people doing anything from anywhere. So a teacher could just be at home wanting to update some lesson plans or something. I mean, heck, it could even be done at the beach. Now, I don't know about this guy. Personally, if I'm at the beach, I'd rather just enjoy the sun and, and the uh, scenery rather than trying to use my device to do work. But the point is that we really have a lot more flexibility, at least theoretically speaking, because of how easy it is to take these devices anywhere with internet connected, uh, connections being available anywhere through cellular connections, uh, Wi-Fi being available a lot of places. They could happen anywhere, um, but you know there are some challenges around that. So if we look at, again, what have these smartphones done to us? What have these tablets done here and how they've changed the landscape? You know, there's some old scary statistics that are on this slide here. And the, number one is that there are more iPhones being sold on a daily basis than there are human beings coming into this world. 
So you know that's and that's just one very specific platform. Not even talking about iOS because if I say iOS, you've got you know iPod Touches, I've got iPads, obviously. Just the iPhone itself. That's how many of those are being sold. Now, if I look at a broader landscape and I pick up the Android side, a lot of Androids being sold. You know, we see a lot of statistics from the. Uh, different analysts that there's actually in total Android has a lot more devices out there than iOS does but with Android is a lot of complication you know this slide is saying 110 different devices that are using Android in some fashion I'll be honest that's an outdated figure I mean that was something we pulled at one point when generating this I know that number is actually much larger now so you've got this complex environment, tons of different devices. If your students decide they want to bring in Android, you got all these iPhones. Haven't even touched on things like Windows Phone, which you know Microsoft's been pushing quite a bit. Haven't really touched on BlackBerry. You know that's that's still around. So all these different things are out there. So at the end of the day, what you've got is you know everyone who's an employee. So all your faculty, staff probably have a mobile device of some sort. Maybe it's their own. Maybe it's one that the the school actually handed them. Um, but at the same time, the security features that are out there, because Apple does provide security, Google does, Microsoft does, BlackBerry does, those security features aren't always even being leveraged by the device. They're there, they're available, you just need something to sort of flip that switch, if you will, and turn that on. Right? So how do you go ahead and, and do that? <clears throat> because at the end of the day, some things haven't changed. You have a need for security. Right? Back, that was needed as, as soon uh, well, let me rephrase that, that was needed from the get-go with desktops, but really once devices started to leave the environment, you saw that need really increase, right? Laptops made it to where data was potentially going to be outside of the, the district. And if you think about it, you know, if you've got someone that's in a financial aid office, they may have some documents that they work on that's got student social security numbers and things like that. You've got teachers who, uh, if they're uh, in the special education department, special ed students that they work with, they've got the special ed plans, the IEPs, I believe they're called. So you really have the potential for some sensitive data out there on laptops or now on even these smaller devices. And if you look at some of those stats there, we can see how many devices are lost or stolen every minute in the United States alone, just in the U.S. And then if we look at laptops, how many of those go missing? You know, are our friendly TSA agents keeping the sky safe? They're, you know, picking up 12,000 laptops a week. So none of this has changed just because there's smaller devices that's needed. And of course, we've been there through all this as well. And you'll see as we're going to the presentation that you know we haven't changed. We've been there doing the security aspect on laptops and desktops for years. We're able to do that on uh, uh, mobile devices as well. But again, I don't want to get ahead of myself. Um, the other thing about it too is you know, you've got that acceptable use policy that usually everyone has to sign, especially at least faculty staff, maybe not students, but faculty staff at least have to sign that in order to gain access uh, to the resources that the university has or the school district has. How many of them will actually know what's in that policy? You know, how many of them read that? Probably very few. I would guess that most people will just blindly sign it and go ahead and say, now give me access to my resources. So they really don't even know what your IT policies are. And if they don't know what they are, they don't really care. They're not going to abide by them. They're going to do their own thing, right? So how do you go ahead and still say, well, you know what, because we know they probably aren't aware of it and aren't going to consciously try to adhere to it, what can we do to basically enforce it from an electronic means? And again, you know, that, the last point in there is about that sense of information. I've already touched on that, but if I don't know my security policies, I'm even more likely to have some of that uh, sensitive information that's on my device that really shouldn't be get it, getting out into the open, but very easily could. So again, what hasn't changed, as I mentioned a minute ago, we've been there all along, and so we've been providing file and print access, right? That's kind of our bread and butter. Uh, we've had management capabilities. All that is still there. Users want access to their stuff. That doesn't change when they're on a smaller device. And if you don't give them a way to do it, they will find a way. And we'll talk about that in, in all these aspects here in a, a few minutes. And again, IT, you need control. You need to see what's going on in the environment. Again, that doesn't change just because you've got additional devices coming on, these smaller form factor devices, as I like to call them. So again, thank goodness we're here. We're able to help with really a comprehensive solution. So that really touches on some of those initial slides I had there where we don't just say, oh, here's a mobile file solution or here's a mobile printing. You know, there's a lot of vendors that offer these point solutions. They did one or two. 
Um, maybe they're trying to get even further into the environment because it's a hot space. You know, file and print is something that we've done. We're the, you know, the godfathers of this. I mean, let's face it, we've been here since 1983, the re original release of NetWare, and we've been handling file and print uh, on a network ever since then, right? And that hasn't changed. All we've done is we've extended that now to mobile devices and expanded the reach so that you no longer have to have a Novell infrastructure. You could have a Microsoft infrastructure, a Google infrastructure, and still be able to leverage some of these uh, uh, solutions that we have. And again, device management with our ZenWorks line, that's been there for, I believe, around 20 years now, as I recall, using some of the very earlier versions. You know, the, the, if anybody remembers the Novell application launcher, which is built into NetWare, and then later on the ZenWorks starter pack, things like that. So we've been doing that originally with Windows. Then that got expanded to Linux, got expanded to Mac, and now, you know, obviously we've expanded that even further, iOS, Android, BlackBerry, things like that. So let's talk about these individual pieces and go into a little more detail about them. And then, like I said, we'll, we'll do a little bit of demonstration here um, towards the end. So let's talk about files first of all. That's the one that really is, is the hottest one I see, and then we, you know, the other pieces come into it. But this is the one that really your users are going to drive some demand for. Because at the end of the day, users have these files. They need to leverage them. They need to work on them. I mean, that's, that's what's needed on a daily basis for the learning process to happen. Well, where are those files stored? You know, there's a good chance that you've got files on file servers of some sort. Could be Microsoft Windows, could be Novell Network, Novell Open Enterprise Server. Uh, you may have some files that users have been starting to store out there in the cloud. You've got, you know, Google is, is obviously you know, popular right now, especially in the K through 12 space. I'm seeing some Office 365 in the higher ed space. So with O365, you've got, uh, I want to say SkyDrive, but I remember that's OneDrive now. Uh, you've got OneDrive from Microsoft, Google Drive, and of course you've got some of the other solutions that have been around, things like Dropbox and Box. Even social networking can be a source. So let's talk about that. That's really confusing. Me as a user, I can say I love Google Drive, or I could say I love OneDrive, but I gotta get those files there somewhere. And if a lot of those files are still sitting out there on my F drive, my P drive, my H drive, whatever drive ever you call, well now I gotta move them somewhere, right? Disruptive. Who's going to move it? Me, the user, you and IT. If all of it's going to be moved, that's going to be even more disruptive. If only some of it's going to be moved, that may not seem disruptive, but it becomes confusing when I try to figure out, all right, where's the latest version of this document? Is it the one I copied up to Google Drive to share with someone else, or is it the one that's sitting out there on the O drive, right? Who knows? So users are going to leverage those resources if they're available, and if you and IT don't provide any way to get that sort of Google Drive, Dropbox, OneDrive experience leveraging all that existing content that's there, your users are just going to get around everything. So what happens when they do that? Now is it confusing like I've talked about, and now is it disruptive? But security is a huge concern. Right? We've seen cases like with Dropbox, for instance. Uh, they, Dropbox and Box both got hit by heart bleed recently. Uh, in the, even before that, a couple of years ago, Dropbox had, I believe, about a four-hour period uh, where anybody could get into any Dropbox account without using a password because they actually weren't doing any password verification. All you needed was someone's email address, and boom, you had access to all their files. Uh, of course, you know, there's the NSA thing. We won't even and, and bring that up, uh, but that's something to think about. But just, you know, when it's out there in the cloud, no controls over it whatsoever. So, you know, it may seem beneficial to say, hey, I can get out of the storage business and I can go ahead and let someone else host it. But now you've got a whole host of challenges potentially. And I haven't even talked about other logistics things like, you know, bandwidth utilization and stuff like that. You may have some fast pipes to the Internet, but if everybody's taking, you know, huge PDFs and, and huge PowerPoints and they're, you know, putting them up in the cloud, if it's a 50 meg file times, you know, I don't know, 30,000 students, you can see where, what that's going to potentially do to your internet connectivity. So we could solve that with Novell Filer. With it, you can think of it as a sort of, a, if you aren't familiar with it, a corporate Dropbox, an enterprise Dropbox. So essentially it's, it's, it allows you to sort of cloud enable, if you will, your files. Take all that existing information that you've got out there on your file servers, and again, it could be Microsoft file servers or Novell file servers. We don't really care where they are. They could even sit on NAS. But we'll go ahead and enable users to get access to them the way that they would if they leveraged a Dropbox, Google Drive, OneDrive, that type of thing. We've got clients available for OS X. We've got clients available for Windows. We've got mobile clients. 
We've got a web client. So no matter where you are, what device you're using, what platform you're on, users can get access to their information, number one. And number two, they can actually share that information very easily. So that's huge. That's a huge benefit right there in the uh, education space. Right? A teacher could go ahead and have a folder that's shared out with all of his or her students that contains all the files needed for everyone to start on, let's say, the next project that the, that's going to be working on or something like that. Um, students working together, like my personal experience. I went back to school about seven years ago to a, a college here in the Chicago area, North Central College, and, and one of the assignments I had was to work on this. It was, it was actually, I think it was a marketing class I took, and uh, we were working together it was about uh, five or six of us, and we needed to email. Well, I shouldn't say we needed to email, but we needed to work on these different documents. We used email because that's all that was really uh, available. I mean, we could have tried Dropbox or something, but at the time there wasn't anything that would really make it easy for us to collaborate. You know, something like Fire, Filer would have changed that game uh, very easily. So with Filer, you know, again, you can see a screenshot of iPad uh, of an iPad rather very easy to use. I'll skip through these couple of slides here because I want you to actually see it in the demo portion so I won't touch on the interface right here. But I do want to quickly mention is just the architecture. Think of it as a black box. It's delivered as a virtual appliance that's meant for you know, VMware, Hyper-V, other virtualization environments. And with it, it's got all the different pieces needed to sort of bridge that divide from the stuff you've got on the right, so all your storage sitting out there, NAS, Windows, uh, uh, OES, Netware, and your clients on the left, a whole variety of clients. We'll point to your directory you have there, AD or E directory, to sort of file or enable those users, if you will, but your directory remains the, the number one source. And then from there, we're able to do a whole host of things. Index the content, so if I just, I can't remember where a file is saved or even remember the name of it, I can still find it as long as I know a, a word or a phrase that's in there. Email notifications, so I don't have to keep logging into Filer to see if stuff's changed. Let Filer tell me about it. And a little thing there in the bottom right corner, anybody may have uh, noticed that there, SharePoint. Not in there yet, but that's one of the things we're working on because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter where information is stored. So while we support file servers and NAS right now, SharePoint is there, and we're looking at other ways uh, of uh, connecting to different storage areas. So SharePoint's one of the ones on the roadmap, but like I said, you can see some other things coming, so I say stay tuned there. But uh, you know, the bottom line is users getting access to their information no matter where it is and not having to remember, I need to log in this way for this, this way for something else. Okay. But that's only one small piece of the puzzle. All right? I can get to my stuff, and if I'm going to start getting it on my mobile device, you know, maybe it wasn't there available uh, to me previously other than occasionally emailing something via an attachment, what do I do next? I need to print this. And that's going to, you can see that mobile uh, printing uh, scenario coming into play more and more as users get access to more and more content on their mobile devices. So hopefully, you know, in your environments, the challenges aren't quite like this lady with all the papers there. She looks pretty upset. And personally, I would be upset too if I had an old HP desk jet printer, which is, I think, what she has in the back corner there. But the point being is that printing shouldn't be a hassle. You know, it's something that we've supplied uh, on the desktop for years. We've made it very easy. And it's something that should be just as easy on a mobile device. And if you think about Novell, we've really provided quote unquote mobile printing for a long time. If you had users that were what, we could, what you could call mobile users, as in they went from say one building to the next, one campus to another, you know, we've had this thing, you see a screenshot there, we can build maps to make it very easy to find the printers. So I don't have to remember the name of it or an address or anything like that. I can just look at a map, find the printer nearest to where I am, and then just click on it and install it. So we've done that, but we've extended that even further to the mobile device. Again, you see a screenshot here. I'm going to skip past that because I want you to see in the demo a couple of ways that I can print. But I do want to talk architecture for a second. Again, a black box, similar story as Filer, VMware, Hyper-V, et cetera. Drop that virtual appliance in place, point it to a directory, point it to the different printers, and we don't care what those printers are. They could be uh, HP printers, Lexmark, Xerox, Canon, Ricoh, 
anything, right? As long as it's on the network, we're going to be able to talk to this guy supplying both mobile printing and desktop printing. Right? We recently uh, sold uh, quite a bit of this to a very large uh, state government that actually had tons of, of print, desktop print, I should say, challenges after moving over to Windows and AD. And so they've decided to standardize on iPrint across the entire state, whether you are on the side that's already migrated to Microsoft, you're on the side that's still on Novell, Everyone is going to be using iPrint just for desktop printing. And it was interesting because we started a conversation about mobile, and next thing we know, there are desktop challenges. So I do bring it up, even though we're talking about mobile devices today, if you uh, are in an environment where you've seen some desktop printing challenges, you're in a Microsoft environment, we can help. Um, obviously, if you're a Google environment, we can definitely help there since Google is going to be quite limited with cloud print, mainly supporting you know, Android and uh, Chromebooks. So you know, if you want to be able to support more platforms than that, you want to, you want to support iOS and whatnot, we can do that. A variety of ways of printing. We can do a native iPrint app, currently available for Android and iOS, soon uh, also for BlackBerry as well as Windows Phone. We can also do email-based printing. So as long as a device can send an email, like a Chromebook, we can go ahead and print. And then we also have air print capability. So instead of going out and buying all these new printers so that they've got AirPrint built in or Google Cloud Print or whatever, leave all your printers alone. Don't go through all that expense and instead you know, spend just a little bit of money to put iPrint into the environment and get all those mobile printing capabilities added into your environment. So with that, and I know I'm going fast, but I want to be cognizant of time because I think about 15 minutes and I want to get into the demo. So I'm going to go into this last piece here. What about managing your devices? All right, so I've given users access to resources they didn't have before, and that's great. They can get to files. They can print. That's awesome. It's something they've done for 30 years on a desktop. Now they can do it on a mobile device finally. Great. But in IT, you need to manage it. Regardless of the size of organization, you know, if you're a very large environment and you've got a network operation center like NASA does here in a screenshot, great. But even if you don't, you still need to be able to manage these devices, regardless of the size. Because at the end of the day, users want access to everything, right? We didn't talk about email. Because most, most people at this point have a way to kind of handle getting email on a mobile device. But people need access to applications, which we'll talk about in a second here. And then, of course, file and printing. You know, we've talked about that already, about some other solutions. So they want access to everything, right? The, the users are, are very demanding like that. But you still need the control. You need to make sure they... Uh, these devices adhere to any kind of rules you have that they comply with, not just your own rules, but if you've got any state regulations or anything like that that adheres to that. And you want to be able to report on all this. You want to remediate any problems. You know, you, you want all the things that you've been doing on a desktop, essentially, from a management aspect, extended out there to a mobile device. And again, we at Novell, we ha handle that quite easily. We've had Zenworks, as I mentioned previously, for years, handling a, you know, the desktop platforms. Now you've got the mobile platforms in place there as well. And so you, what you've got here with Zenworks is essentially a very comprehensive solution that manages the entire life cycle of the device as it comes into the environment and as that device is retired. The entire life cycle as far as a user coming into the environment you know, student, new students in the fall or whatever, and all the devices that they need and all the resources that they need until eventually they are outside of the, uh, the environment. So they graduate or whatever, move away, something like that. A couple of screenshots. We'll blow through this stuff because, again, I want to go ahead and uh, highlight some of the interface uh, once we get in there. So some of architecture, a little different from Filer and iPrint. It's not quite the same black box in that with, with Zenworks Mobile Management, I do install some software on a Windows server rather than being appliance-based. Uh, but once that's done, I'm going to go ahead and act as an active sync proxy to get p email onto the device. I can push out apps. If you don't have Filer, I could actually push out a few files with this. So I do a lot of things with this, and the main thing is I've got control. Even if it's a BYOD scenario, as a lot of schools are, especially higher ed, where you allow, you know, allow students to come in and get access to the network, you still want some management capabilities, and you'll see how we can kind of distinguish uh, between the two when we get in there. So to quickly uh, close this off so we can get a demo, whole host of things you need, whether it's management, file, print, email, collaboration, anything, we can do it. So you can see here all these platforms, very rich feature set for Windows, OS X, iOS, and Android. A little less on the Linux side, a little less on the BlackBerry side, but we definitely are going to hit those major platforms that you know, are really what make up the bulk of your environment. And you know, it's great to see that 
you know, people are actually noticing this. It's one thing for me to preach how great it is, but, you know, who signs my paycheck? So let's look at, uh, you know, what some of those uh, other customers are out there. A couple of these are education-related. So you've got a school district in Wisconsin with, using ZenWorks Mobile Management. Um, the other thing, too, is uh, what I really like is the very last quote, which is a partner out in Ohio that actually works quite a lot with schools, and actually he's also very act, uh, uh, active, I should say, in that TTP that I mentioned earlier that he's been around this space a while. And anybody that's been watching us for a long time has been seeing, seeing our ups and downs. And the people for a period of time are starting to get concerned over what's the direction of Val, what are we doing. And, you know, I think his comment really just sums up perfectly all the innovation we've done in these spaces, all the products that I've been talking about here with Filer, iPrints, and Mobile Management. Those are things that we've been innovating over the past year plus now, actually two years for the mobile management piece. And... You know what, it, I, I just love seeing the fact that people are, are noticing that. So uh, last, uh, oh, I forgot about this success story before I go to my last things. Real quick, University of Cincinnati recently needed a, a secure file sharing solution. Filer was the key. They also implemented something called Storage Manager, which we touched on Wednesdays. Uh, call. So if you weren't on Wednesday's presentation, I definitely urge you to go and look at the recording where I talked about how we can manage the file you know, madness, if you will, in your environments with Novell File Reporter Storage Manager. So it's a great real-world example of a uh, higher ed institution using it. Evals, we've got evals available. I'll leave it at that because I'm running short on time. And we've also got training available. And again, I'll leave it at that because I'm short on time. Um, Quickly, I don't see any questions in the chat window, so I am just going to move straight on into demonstration here since we're a little short. But again, if you do have any questions, type those in the chat window, and then Nathan will just uh, relay that to me as they come in. Let me get my iPad screen up here. So give me a second, and I'm going to turn on my uh, air play here so we can mirror the screen, uh, maybe, if it cooperates with me. I did this earlier, and that's going to uh, it's going to stink if this thing doesn't want to cooperate with me. Bear with me, everyone. Well, what is going on? Let me restart. I've got an application that I've installed on here that uh, mirrors my display. And uh, for some reason right now, it's not wanting to uh, do its magic. Now that I've restarted it, let's see what happens. There we go. There we go. Wouldn't be a live demo without at least one glitch. All right. So let's go in here. I've got a, a folder on my iPad that I've got a lot of those Novell mobile apps on there. I want to go ahead and hop into Filer since you know we talked about that, spent a few minutes on that. And I'm just going to be scratching the surface. I definitely encourage you to uh, uh, you know, follow up with me if you'd like to learn a little bit more about it. But to go into it quickly, when I log in, I can get access to my stuff, although my stuff wouldn't sound real good, so we call it my files. Uh, so it's really going to be my home directory and my H drive that you may have out there in your environments. Um, on the flip side of that, or what we call net folders, that's just file or speak for shared drives, shared folders, map drives, whatever you want to call them. So all, all that content that's out there in your environment that's not in someone's home directory. And then I've got ways to access the stuff that's been shared either with me or the stuff that I've shared, things like that. So let's quickly go out there and take a look. You know, I go out into this uh, My Files area here, and let's see, let's see, I'm working on some projects, and in this case, you know, I really love Tabasco sauce, and I'm going to use that as part of my uh, marketing class here where we have to come up with a, you know, fictional sales pitch or something. So I've got, you know, a, a pretend contract that's out there. You can see I quickly can navigate, and I can go through here and just tap on files, view them, things like that. Got this picture here that was to inspire me about uh, spicy food because it's, uh, well, as you can see, a habanero pepper that was chopped up that I actually chopped up and put in a pot of chili. Side note, uh, one little pepper really makes a big pot of chili spicy, but it was good. Um, you know, people can collaborate on this. I've got this document shared with a few people. So as it was shared, you know, with fellow students or with, you know, uh, other teachers, whoever it might be, everyone can communicate. And that's really important. If I'm not emailing this document back and forth like in the past, how do I collaborate? Because after all, if you're going the email route, you wouldn't just send a blank email 
and hope that the person knew what to do with the attachment, you would actually say in there, hey, what do you think about this? Give me your thoughts. You know, look at the changes on page 27, et cetera, et cetera. Now I can take all that collaboration, tie that right into a file, and now I don't have to go out and say, well, I've got email for discussing and working on it, but I've got Filer to actually access the content. Let's just put it all right in Filer, make it nice and easy. All right, so let me close that down. We'll shrink this window a little bit. I can very easily share it, though. So you can see here where I've shared it with several people already. So these are the folks that were commenting. I'll go ahead and hit the Share button here. I can go ahead and choose to share it with someone else. All I've got to do if I want to share it is just type in their, their uh, name. So those are all coming again from Active Directory, eDirectory via LDAP. So I could easily tap on a person. Or I can just type in a person's email address if they're outside of the organization. And you can see that's what's happened here. The second from the top where it's got my name, Joe Martin, I actually sh excuse me, shared this with my, I think it was my Yahoo account in, in this case. But point being is that super easy to share with people internal and external. As an administrator, though, you have control over that, so you can determine what types of sharing is allowed. So keep that in mind. Everything I'm showing you here can be locked down. I've just got everything open in my demo environment. Within IT, you can choose how much of this you want to use. Uh, when I share, I could choose what sort of access that person gets. Are they only allowed to view it? Can they actually make changes to it? If I'm sharing a folder, because I don't have to share just specific files, I could share an entire folder. There's even a third permission that allows them to add new file content into there. And the other thing, for at least when sharing with internal users, I can determine are they allowed to then reshare that with anybody. That's not available for an external user. External users can access it. They can't reshare just because it'd be like the wild, wild west. I mean, it could get out of hand in a hurry. Um, and I've got public sharing, so I can even just generate a link and send that on to someone to be able to email it. So very easy to share that uh, document, very easy to access that document. But let's say now I want to go ahead and print this. Like, you know what, I've got a cool color printer here. I want to be able to print this uh, picture of the hobby narrow paper, and I'm going to just tape it up. So let's go in here and say open in, and I'm going to actually choose Novell iPrint. So right there, I'm tying the two together. From an end user perspective, they don't realize those are two different products that were installed. They don't know any of that. They just know, hey, when I need a print, open in the iPrint app. I can go out there, pick which printer I want. So there's a couple printers in the environment, just a, you know, a test printer and then my actual office yet at home. And you can see I get quite a bit of control as well over how I want to print this. So I can choose you know, double-sided color, uh, number of copies, paper size, all that stuff. It's basically a very similar experience to like what your users are used to from a desktop. Now, um, that's cool. I've got one more piece that I'll show you. Uh, one thing though to highlight is the thing about print too. I, I should mention this before I move on. When I'm using this iPrint app, I have to authenticate. Now you didn't see me log in and that's because I previously logged into the iPrint app, put in my uh, name, password, and said say password. But when I send this print job, even though I'm saying for my iPad, you know who sent it. So you still get the accounting, the auditing capabilities. If any of you are familiar with paper cut, a, you know, they do print accounting, if you will. We can integrate right with that. So if you want to say at the beginning of the semester, you get $3 of print credit, and every time you print, uh, that gets decremented, you know, $0.05, cents, $0.10, cents, whatever. That's going to apply if it's coming from a mobile device using this iPrint app. Don't lose any functionality. However, some people may not want to install an app, especially if they're an iOS user. They say, I just want to do it the way that's just built into iOS. So with that, and I'm waiting for this to uh, hopefully catch up here, there we go, is I can go ahead and do AirPrint like I was talking about earlier. And this old HP Office that I have here does not have AirPrint capabilities built into it, but it doesn't matter. I can still find it because iPrint is advertising it. Notice that second printer is not in here because as a minister I have that flexibility. Some printers I can do by maybe AirPrint and iPrint because I want to do both. Other ones AirPrint only or iPrint only. Same thing for email printing, which I'm not going to show here. So those three ways of printing, I can choose on a per printer basis how to expose it by one, all, just a couple of those methods. just depends on what you want to do. So with that, one more thing I want to highlight is some management capabilities. And I know we've only got a couple minutes left, so let me quickly log in here and show how we can do that through some application whitelisting and blacklisting. And it helps. I remember my sign in here. All right, let me get logged in. 
I'm going to go back and forth between this and my iPad real quick just to show this. So out here, you know, we've got a lot of things. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. I just want to show you where I've got the different policies I can configure my environment. You see a lot of different policies here because, you know, again, we log in and we can create different policies to apply to different devices. And we do that so, you know, during a demo I don't hose somebody else by turning on a restriction or something. But what I want to highlight, when I go to whitelist or blacklist, you'll see this little cheat sheet, by the way, throughout Zenworks Mobile Management. Anybody that's dealt with uh, any type of mobile device management has realized, you know, you've got some policy settings that apply to Android, some apply to iOS, some apply to, you know, Windows Phone. Um, in our case, on top of that, we support uh, touchdown for Android for iOS, so it's even additional platforms. This cheat sheet just tells you which of these settings are actually applicable, right? So it's very easy; you don't have to keep track. But you can see, I don't have any blacklist turned on, but I have one defined out there that says if you have things like cut the rope and words with friends, block access to email. So just a quick thing to show how you can enforce some of those policy settings, especially if this is an iPad that the district owns that you're giving to a teacher. You don't want them to start installing a bunch of games on there. So quickly show you without any restrictions, checking for mail, and if you can see it in the bottom, updated just now. So connected out just fine, no problems because there's no restrictions. Now again, I know I have some applications installed that violate policy, so I'm going to enable that. Notice I have that under corporate, by the way. So that's how we can handle BYOD very easily. You can say if it's an individually owned and liable device, so that would be that right column. Here's that set of settings. The left settings are going to be for devices owned by the district, owned by the university that are issued then. So that way <clears throat> you don't have to create different policies just for those two different types of devices. But quickly, I've turned that on here for this device, and this one is designated as, as corporate liable. I'm going to go in, try to check for mail, and we're going to give it a second, and we'll get a failure, and there we go, cannot get mail. So you can see how very easily I was able to go ahead and apply this blacklist. So again, you know, there's a lot of MDM solutions. There's a ton of things that we could talk about what we can do, but I really like to illustrate that, talking about how users don't know about your security policies and things like that. They, even if they don't know the security policies, doesn't mean you can't enforce them because by using Zenworks Mobile Management, you can definitely at least make things painful for them by saying you get, you're going to lose your access to email, um, you're going to lose access to your apps that have been pushed out through Zenworks Mobile Management, things like that if you're out of compliance. So don't jailbreak your device. Don't root your device, things like that. And if you do it, you lose your resources. And while that doesn't force them to re remediate that, if you will, they probably are going to want to because they probably want their email, they probably want their apps, so they're not going to leave their device in that state. Um, so with that, I know I ran a little long. Uh, thank you everyone for hanging out uh, here, hanging with me for an extra moment here. Um, Nathan, any closing words from you? No, Joe, this has been a, a great overview, and, and we know everyone's uh, grappling with the explosion of devices on their campuses. If you could just uh, share maybe uh, some of uh, uh, the steps uh, to uh, scoping this out and uh, implementation. I mean, what would be some of the next steps if somebody was interested in this product? Sure. I'd say, you know, reach out to me, and then if I'm not your actual rep, you know, based upon where you are, uh, I'll make sure that we get the right sales engineer involved because we could definitely help you with evaluations. We have evaluation copies of everything if you want to actually deploy it in your own environment or for a couple of them, for Filer and Zen Mobile Management. If you want to play with those a little bit, get an idea for how they work, but you don't want to spin up anything in your environment, we actually have some hosted evaluation centers we have back in Provo that we can provision you on. So I'd say the bottom line is if you're interested in any of this stuff, if you know who your Nobel rep is or you have a sales engineer you work with, reach out to them. If you don't, reach out to me, and we could definitely help you very easily uh, get going.